Welcome back, Classic Crew, to a React video that's very different. I usually don't do these types of videos, but I figured, you know, I react to my own content, but I don't react to other content out there. And I've been seeing more people do this, and I was like, is this the YouTube meta? Is this the content uh, that I should be working on? And I realize it's it actually kind of aligns good. So I've been seeing this video, for example, uh, for the last few weeks running around. I've only watched like maybe the first minute and I figured this would be a good one to kind of share my thoughts on because it is a topic that's very relevant to me. When I started Monster Hunter, it was in the months leading up to the drop of Rise. And so I experienced Monster Hunter World at the same time as Monster Hunter Rise, pretty much. I played Monster Hunter World for about a month or two, and then Monster Hunter Rise dropped, and then I was playing one on Tuesday, one on Thursday. So I played the two games, and I've shared my thoughts a lot about the differences between these games, and that they very much are crafted in two different ways. And of course, I have preferences to them. I think one game does some things better than another and vice versa. I think there are pros and cons to each game. And at the end of the day, there's one that I clearly prefer. Doesn't mean it's the best. And there's some that you might prefer uh, that your friends don't agree with. So I've definitely seen this divide. I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast and I've seen a lot of people talk about this video specifically and it looked very well made. So I want to watch it, share my first impressions with you instead of watching it by myself and then re-recording, writing my thoughts, re-recording. I figured, hey, this is way more efficient. So uh, let's see what they have to say here. And we'll pause as we move along. In every community that I've participated in, there's always a sizable division between the fans. These divisions are caused... Uh, we're already going to start because the fact that they're using Breath of the Wild to... Whoop, I actually forgot to take off. Uh, hang on, let's restart this. There we go. Uh, the fact that they're actually using Breath of the Wild as an intro to talk about divides between fans... This is probably another video I'm going to have to make around Tears of the Kingdom because that game, um, it, Zelda, I think, is starting to branch off and creating two threads. As a longtime Zelda fan, like, love Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, getting mixed feelings out of it. But that's for another video. Usually, by the developer. They will release a game in a series that is significantly different than the ones that came before. Some fans will like the change, some fans will not like the change, and some will have mixed feelings. These fans will then congregate into different groups that champion different opinions of what the future of the series should look like. Now, in the Monster Hunter community, it is often the case that Monster Hunter fans don't agree with each other on what the next title should look like. In fact, I think that the Monster Hunter community has many more divisions than is typical. There's the realism and speculative evolution people, the veteran pre-Monster Hunter world fans, versus the people that started in World or Rise. So that one, that division, I'm not as aware of it. I've seen it a little bit where people use the word fivers in a kind of negative connotation of like, oh, you fivers don't. So as someone who started in World and actually went back to the old world, I can see the, the different in flavoring. Uh, the only reason I think that's not as much of a relevant conversation is I think we can all agree, unfortunately for the veterans, that the old school Monster Hunter is, I don't see that coming back. Given the success of World and Rise, I just can't imagine Capcom going back to those other games that just didn't sell at the same level as World and Rise. And surprisingly, the biggest and probably most antagonistic groups are the Monster Hunter World fans versus the Monster Hunter Rise fans, despite the fact that they both come from the same generation. Although the gameplay loop remains mostly the same for all Monster Hunter. When you put it like side by side like that, it's it's so drastic. The art style difference of the two games, how much like Rise is so much cleaner, crisp, colorful, which is more in, I, I think Rise is a more natural evolution of the classic Monster Hunter game, whereas World is kind of the deviation. Hunter titles. The experimentation between titles created specific gimmicks and aesthetic differences that spawned different interpretations on what the game's direction should be. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about what the different groups are, what they want out of Monster Hunter, and what caused these divisions in the first place. In order to fully understand the different groups in the community, and why there is such a range of expectations from the fans on what the next title should look like, we first have to look at Monster Hunter's design philosophy. 
and how the team at Capcom develops their games. Before we get too far, I have to, I just realized I did not give a shout out to the original creator of this video, uh, and they are uh, right there on the screen, Rat, Rata Tosker? Not sure how to pronounce that, as I don't know how to pronounce most things, uh, but that's who they are. Video is, was uploaded a few weeks ago, and uh, World vs. Rise will find it. I'll also put a link in the description if you want to check out this video on your own as well. Early in the development of the original Monster Hunter, Capcom shifted from a typical fantasy setting into a more grounded setting, a setting that had fantastical elements, but that also had ecologically conscious explanations for those elements. In Monster Hunter Illustrations 1, there are interviews with the development team that discuss this shift in development. The following is a quote from the director. We had it in our heads that this was going to be a fantasy game, so our ideas tended to gear towards magic and the like. The world as a whole was much more fantastical as well. I doubt any of us expected it to turn out so analog. The lead designer had this to say. When we got down to the nitty gritty of what kind of game is Monster Hunter going to be, really, that's when we dropped the whole magic system. One of the earliest concept movies we created showed a few hunters laying traps and luring a monster to their traps. In those movies, the monsters were always very generic fantasy monsters, like red dragons. Not only were they archetypal dragons, we also had them climbing out of the depths of ancient ruins, where they had no doubt been napping on a huge treasure hoard. So the game itself didn't have a strong connection to nature at first. So, Monster Hunter, early in its development, made a choice to lean away from the generic fantasy they had been working with. This shift in development would become their greatest asset, and make the Monster Hunter game world that we know today. Because I can't think of any other game, and this could just be the fact that I don't play nature games uh, i can't think of any other game that really leans as much into that like nature setting for, for like how how creatures and monsters live in um you know there's nothing really like this that exists there was wild hearts but we don't talk about wild hearts anymore this unique setting allows monster hunter to stand out next to other fantasy game worlds looking into the designs of the monsters in the series we can see that the developers deliberately chose designs that made practical sense in a simulated ecological setting. Quote, Every monster has a bunch of ideas incorporated into each part of its design in order to give the player a better sense of how it lives within the game world. For instance, the hard-looking skin on a Legambi's arms was designed to help it break and change course while gliding, in addition to being resistant to damage. Very cool. It would make me happy if players had fun wondering why the monster's various parts are designed the way they are while actually playing the game. So, as you can see, the monsters are designed to attempt to be realistic. The developers are trying to take their natural environment into account. That's one thing I wish I could appreciate more. And I, to do so, I just need to stop and look at it. Like, the monster designs are... I didn't realize... You know, I knew that there was a lot of attention to detail, but I never realized that about Lagambi, and I'm sure that there's a ton of features like that about all the other monsters. And how that environment might have fueled their evolution. This focus on speculative evolution was always a priority. You can see in this artwork that they were always trying to make a unified fan. Hang on, I've never seen this. Shelled Lizard was able to survive better than most. All right. Oh no, the evolution of a Kezu is very unadapted to a region with little to no predators. Uh, mainly feed on rotten flesh. The weakest of the Shelled Lizards evolved into this form as they were unable to hunt for themselves and resort to feeding on rotting carcasses, ancient fish. Going into the ancient fish, like if we could go back in time and just kill that ancient fish, imagine how much pain we would avoid. No more of that garbage on the left. What else do we have? The top stuff is good. Top stuff is fine. Family tree, where most wyverns evolved from a shelled lizard ancestor that adapted to various different environments and became those wyverns over time. Now, this is probably not canon or, or is at least no longer canon. But the point is, they wanted things to make sense. They were trying to have reasons for why the monsters were the way they were. The following is a staff comment for the Monster Hunter Illustration 1. Even those who do not draw have a set of preconceived notions regarding how a given creature moves. That's why we can't really fudge any major point with regards of a monster's physical structure and movements. If we do, the players are more likely to reject the reality of the monster in question. That's why we spend a lot of time not only on the skeletal structure, but also the meat and skin that we put on any given monster. But then we have cases like Malzino, which just kind of teleports 
which is like, what? And then we also have Valstrax, which has a built-in jet engine. It can be pretty difficult to try and imagine how the skin should hang off of a certain fictional creature, but as I look back through the illustrations for the game, I can see how we improved as we went along, and that makes me happy. So here they admit that they were trying to make the monster move in a realistic way, that both its appearance and its movement were a priority, and they wanted to avoid the player rejecting the reality of the monster in question. One of the best things about Monster Hunter is how it's not just visual and flavor text. These design choices often have gameplay implications, like the Lagambi's arms. They're more resistant to damage because they were designed to help it stop and change directions while sliding on the ice. Another example that shows that they care about this even recently is Zitsuyaku. The following is a quote by Fujioka. We wanted Zitsuyaku to be a grounded monster. That goes for its flash, too, which is different from past iterations, because it doesn't affect the whole field. We made it possible for the player to identify safe areas, because the zone in front of the ear flap lights up while everything behind the monster is safe. We added shells to its nest to increase the flash's effect, so it's a challenge on its home turf. I really like this detail. Zitsi it has shells in its nest? I don't think I understand that. So can he flash more widely when he's back at his nest? Because I never realized that before. Yaku has a inherent inclination to collect reflective shells that increases the potency of its natural weapon when having to defend its home turf. And this is an adaptation that translates into the environment and the gameplay. Hirochika Nagaki in the Monster Hunter Illustrations 2 says... For this the Monster Hunter around, title, I try to capture a sense of living creatures in the designs. That's the theme I follow. I take into consideration not just the thought of making them look cool, but also their dignity as wild creatures, and elements that would facilitate play as a game. To many players, this Ugh. aspect of the game Ugh. is so critical that it should be kept consistent and at the forefront at all times. Using Baroth as an example, that monster was designed entirely around its relationship with the environment. It uses the murky, muddy waters to hide from other creatures, but it also uses the mud to protect itself from the heat of the sun. Capcom even went out of their way to provide a pre-rendered cutscene of Baroth's behaviors outside of the limitations of their in-game engine. In the Baroth ecology video, we can see the developer's vision of this fictional animal, and these concepts translate into gameplay. The behaviors that assist Baroth in survival suddenly become combat gimmicks in the player's battle against the monster. The mud isn't just a fancy visual in a cutscene, and it's not just flavor text in a description. It's integrated into the fight. It coats the Baroth in a protective layer. He slings it around at the hunter to inconvenience him. Quote, For Baroth's design, I thought of a bulldozer clearing away sand and dirt, and combined it with the motif of a caterpillar's carapace. It was decided that this creature lives in bogs, so I figured that it would approach its prey covered in dirt and mud to hide its body. That's when I put the nostrils on the top of its head so that it could still breathe even when submerged in mud. So, the point is, Monster Hunter has always cared about- Here's an idea, sorry, I don't- I'm, I just random thought, but, uh, have they ever done, like, a heat-seeking monster, like a monster that can detect heat? Because that would be something cool. And now I'm just going on a wilds tangent, a wild tangent about wilds. If there was an element that the hunter could cover themselves with, like, mud to lower your heat signature, or to be harder for a monster to see. Like, I feel, I don't know if that's been done in any game yet, but that seems like a very natural evolution here. Like, they're already doing it on monsters, minus the heat seeking. I think that's an element that could really play well. But realism in their designs. They want the monster designs to reflect its relationship with its environment. And if possible, for that relationship to be expressed even in the gameplay, even in the hunt itself. However, Monster Hunter is also not afraid of adding some monsters that aren't grounded in reality at all. In fact, this is a deliberate part of the design process. When asked about the inclusion of blatantly fantastical monsters next to the more grounded ones, Kaname had this to say. When you create a world full of mythical creatures like the Kirin, the entire world starts to feel like a very fantastical place with no basis in reality. Our focus for the world of Monster Hunter was to create a place that would feel like it could be real by tossing in a decidedly fantasy-themed creature into this realistic world. It made the Kirin stand out in the player's eyes, and we hope that such an unexpected surprise will make the world a more exciting place for them to explore. That's why we made the decision to include creatures like Kirin. Wait, Kirin is, in a, is the fantastical monster out of all the other monsters that they have to show? There's 
way more like that. It's a it's basically a horse. It's a horse with a unicorn. The only thing fantastical about it is is a horn. Whereas look at this thing. Like look at the great Jaggers. He has way more fantastical elements. Like he eats a freaking cow and then just walks away with it. Different staff comment. He says. With Monster Hunter 2, we intentionally tried going with a more fantastical feel to our designs, and added new ancient dragon types. We also hoped that this new infusion of ancient dragon monsters would help make existing monsters like Rathian and Rathalos seem more realistic as far as this world was concerned. So, the purpose of Elder Dragons and other less realistic creatures is to provide a contrast. Their inclusion into a mundane world makes that world seem even more realistic in comparison. The Elder Dragon's fantastical nature is reflected even in the game's lore. To the characters, these archetypal fantasy dragons are so unusual that they can't be categorized as normal monsters. Now, in a different quote, Kanemis says, Still, we did manage to put together the feline and velociprey while we were working on the larger dragons. When you are dealing with nature and the creation of a natural environment, you can't help but fill the empty spaces with smaller critters. You can't create a full, vibrant world with just a bunch of boss monsters. So, it's clear that the developers had always intended for these monsters to function in a simulated ecosystem with each other. They wanted the world to feel as real as possible. That's why the monsters in Monster Hunter will eat, drink, sleep, and communicate to one another in ways real-life animals do. They aren't mindless evil monsters out to destroy humanity. They are deliberately crafted animals that live and prey on each other in a fictional ecosystem. And it isn't the case that this is just something that they used to care about and now no longer do. Because in Monster Hunter World, they doubled down on the simulated ecosystem angle, and the developers pushed to take that concept to a new level. In an interview for World, Sujimoto said the following, Once you've decided on a new concept for the next title, which in this case is a living, breathing ecosystem full of rich interactions between predator and prey monsters and little creatures, the hunters are jumping into this world, but even without you, it's kind of getting on with its own business being a realistic ecosystem. Now, for the speculative ecology fans, this is the heart of Monster Hunter. This is what differentiates it from its peers. They hyperfixate on these aspects, and they object when a monster design strays too far from that ideal and becomes unrealistic. And so they tend to butt heads with players that don't care at all about that and are just in Monster Hunter for the fun gameplay. After all, it doesn't matter how a Baroth's body or habits work within the context of a video game, where the objective is to administer damage to the monster. Even after all the work that went into making the ecosystems and world feel living and dynamic, those aspects are mostly irrelevant when you're grinding the same monster a dozen times. The process of creating a fantastical animal is helpful in creating a unique creature design and combat experience, but the details of this process are not important to the player once they're actually playing the game. Or rather, noticing these details and caring about them is optional. Alright, let's move on and talk about the Monster Hunter World versus the Monster Hunter Rise fans. And to do that, we need to talk about the differences between mainline and portable Monster Hunter games. It's a lot Luckily, what we've already this, discussed which... with the speculative... I'm very curious to see where this is going, because we're halfway into it, and so far it's been a description of how the franchise came to be. ...of so, evolution it's... fans will be useful because these groups tend to overlap in some places. In broad strokes, a mainline title is a numbered entry. Monster Hunter 1, 2, 3, 4, and Monster Hunter World. We know that Monster Hunter World is Monster Hunter 5 because it was confirmed by Ryozo Tsujimoto, and he also explains that they changed the naming convention because they didn't want people to see Monster Hunter 5 and think, well, do I have to play the other four? What if I'm lost? It was to prevent new players from being discouraged. But though they've dropped the numbering, the system hasn't gone away. They still release a mainline game and a portable game, and you can determine which is a mainline title by counting the number of dragon heads in the logo. Because Monster Hunter Wilds has six serpent heads in the logo, it is Monster Hunter 6. And as further evidence, a while ago there was a leak in Capcom. That leak revealed that internally they're still using the numbered naming conventions for Monster Hunter 6. Now I mention this because the mainline and portable games have distinct qualities. Typically, mainline titles put more focus on narrative storytelling, and by extension, the developers also focus more... Okay, to be fair, this is probably the one area that I definitely have no context for, because I have not played any of the portable games, as far as I know, even though two of the ones I played are portable. Uh, but anyways... More on world building, and thus fantasy ecology. 
Portable titles are less concerned with that. They put more focus on the gameplay loop, experimenting with player actions and their dynamics with the monsters. They tend to be more experimental and disregard previously established norms. Mainline titles tend to have a more nuanced narrative, focused on character dynamics and uncovering the mysteries of the ecological world. As for gameplay, the mainline titles tend to have slower, heavier, more methodical, more grounded combat. Portable titles tend to be flashier, faster, more experimental. Maybe most critically, mainline titles try to keep the ecological aspects in the forefront. It's incorporated into the overall art direction, and as a result, the art direction will appear more down-to-earth, more mundane, grittier. The portable titles are less interested in that. Both the characters and the locations will be louder and more expressive, and their monster designs are often less interested in adhering to the realism that Monster Hunter is known for. Now, these tendencies I'm describing are not absolute. The design direction of both the mainline and portable games will bleed into each other sometimes. And there are clear exceptions to all the things that I've said. But generally, it is the case that the games differ in the ways I've described. With all of this context, it should be easy to see why there's so much online contention between fans on which direction the series should... I actually don't even know which ones are portable. Because to me, there's Monster Hunter 1 and 2 on the PlayStation 2. Both of those were remade for PSP as far as I know. And then there's 3, 4, which are mainline titles, but are also portable on the 3DS. So I, I don't quite see how it all jumps from one to another, actually. Should go. And I really hope he, he kind of outlines it. It'd be great if he did that, but if he doesn't, I'll have to look it up on my own. Radically different art direction and gameplay changes between releases will generate wildly different interpretations of what Monster Hunter is and what it should be. When Monster Hunter World released, it was, and continues to be, its best-selling game of all time. It jettisoned the series into the mainstream. It's no exaggeration to say that most players were new players that had never touched the series. People that had been with the series for a long time and understood this difference between mainline and portable game were the minority. And so when Monster Hunter Rise was released, it appeared as a departure from everything World had set out to do. Even now, there are a huge number of Monster Hunter World fans that actively dislike Monster Hunter Rise. And even if they didn't outright dislike Rise, they certainly didn't want it going further into the Rise direction. They wanted the next Monster Hunter game after Rise to be more like Monster Hunter World. The real source of this conflict, I think, is that it wasn't clear that Capcom and Monster Hunter would continue in this mainline portable direction. The release of World began the fifth generation of Monster Hunter. And it changed so much so drastically that it made the future uncertain. There was a fear that Rise represented the permanent future of Monster Hunter as a whole, that the games would become much faster, less realistic, less interested in the monster ecology, more interested in rushing you from one fight to the next, and less interested in the preparation and hunting simulation aspect. That's fair. Now that the trailer for Monster Hunter Wilds confirms that it is in fact Monster Hunter 6, and that they are going to keep the mainline portable distinction, I suspect that the World and Rise fans will have less to be antagonistic over. Alright, finally, the last group is the old Monster Hunter fans, the veteran fans, versus the new fans which they consider to be people that started in Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter Rise. So he's basically arguing the World vs. Rise whole debacle is just because there's fear. The World fans don't want the games to change and the rice fans don't want their games to change without understanding that there's always been kind of two formulas to monster hunter which i agree with that makes sense but it's seems basic monster hunter has been around for 20 years and there's a vocal minority of veterans that are upset by the overall changes in the game's development since the earlier entries older fans have been clamoring for a return to form for a long time and their group tends to overlap with the mainline fans and the speculative ecology fans. The veteran fans that I'm describing aren't just anybody that likes the old games. It's specifically the people that like the old games and don't like the new ones. They believe that too much of the old design was abandoned with Monster Hunter World and Rise just exacerbated the problem. They weren't satisfied with Monster Hunter World because they believe that the clunkier design choices of the earlier titles managed to enhance the hunting simulation experience. That's fair. The technical There's limitations in the old games created specific art directions and gameplay design choices that have since been gentrified to keep up with what's considered standard for AAA titles. 
Players that played the first four generations will be fond of gameplay mechanics that are now considered outdated, sluggish, or confusing. They are unhappy with things like the changing or removal of the tracking systems, bug nets and pickaxes being streamlined, the removal of hot and cold drinks, the ability to access your camp to manage your entire inventory after you've departed from a quest. They resent these changes being considered quality of life changes. They don't see them as quality of life changes, they see them as gameplay mechanics that incentivized careful preparation and play, agree. which in turn complemented the monster hunting simulation. Also agree. Their main complaint is that Monster Hunter strays further and further into a pure action game. And the more things are streamlined, the more they push you into going to the monster quickly, then the less room there is for the hunting simulation aspect, which right. these players value so highly. Monster Hunter's original tracking system involved either wandering around the map when you're new, or understanding the monster spawn locations when you're experienced, and then locating the monster and hitting it with a paintball. The paintball then tracks its position on the map. In World, they replaced this system with the Scout Fly system, which still required some level of tracking, but was much less demanding on the player. In Rise, the tracking system was removed completely, and now the monsters are always visible on the map. The veteran players were upset with this change because it streamlines a massive part of the hunting process. Similarly, Monster Hunter World introduced a base camp that lets you manage all of your items. This, along with the fast travel to these camps, grants players access to everything they've ever collected, essentially giving them infinite healing, infinite potions, infinite of any material that they've farmed, and completely removes any of the tension you might have experienced by hunting a monster and noticing that you're running low on mega potions, because you can simply disengage and go get more. They also appreciate the slower, more methodical combat found in the older titles. And even how long it takes to heal, and how long you're stuck not being able to move while you're doing it. Many of these old systems like item management and tracking systems slowed the game down and required the player to put extra care into all of their actions. They needed to be 100% sure they were ready to depart on the quest. The veteran players that enjoy these systems see them as part of the overall game experience that makes Monster Hunter what it is. Now, the interesting thing about this group is that it's not a monolith. Individuals in this group will overlap with the speculative ecology fans, the mainline fans, and even the Monster Hunter World fans. And they believe different things to different degrees. Some want a complete return to tradition, but some just want to get rid of the infinite camp restocks and a more involved tracking system. Some want a general increase in difficulty, and for that difficulty to be scattered across the low rank and high rank, and not just centered around the end game experience. Some want the combat to be slower, more methodical, less reliant on counters like Monster Hunter Rise. But many that want that don't necessarily want to go back to Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, they mean Monster Hunter World level of speed. There's even people like me who started in Monster Hunter World, but went back to the older titles and can see that they Those did, in fact, have things of value that could be maybe introduced in the newer games. Speaks better than me, though. Expresses himself. All right, that covers all of the different groups pretty well. My personal opinion is that we're in a very good place when it comes to how Capcom is running Monster Hunter. The fact that they're keeping the mainline and portable distinction, and that they're alternating releases between them, is a very good thing. I'm probably the biggest division today. right now in Monster Hunter is between the Monster Hunter World fans and the Monster Hunter Rise fans, and they also tend to be the most antagonistic to one another. Now that Monster Hunter Wilds is coming out, and it's obvious that it's going to be more like Monster Hunter World, just like the World fans hoped, they, and any fans that overlap with them, no longer need to be afraid that the franchise is moving in a direction that they didn't understand. I suspect that both the World and Rise fans will gain a new appreciation for each other's game, now that they can treat the mainline and portable releases as palate cleansers. Instead of viewing them as existential threats, they'll see them as just a way to pass the time while they wait for the next Monster Hunter game of their preference. Anyway, that's the end of this video. Alright, I have a lot to say. So let's start off with addressing the differences between the groups. Totally agree with pretty much everything he said in this video. And there is no right or wrong here. It comes down to your playstyle, what you like, what you like from the different games. So. All of these different mechanics, I think, are great. I think it is great that everybody is discussing them. I think having discourse about what you like, what I like, what I don't like, is great. 
because what Capcom is doing here by providing different mechanics, different experiences, gives us as a community the chance to really explore and say, oh, I really like that. Oh, I really don't like that. And then we talk about it. And as a community, these groups start forming. And that provides feedback to Capcom of like, okay, this mechanic in general, like people like it. This mechanic in general, like Rampages, nobody likes it. Uh, I'm picking on Rampages because I think that is the one mechanic I have seen the fewest fans of. I'm sure there are some out there, um, but I have seen far more haters than lovers on that. So anyways, this whole discourse thing, I think very healthy for a community. I think it really shows um, a passion that we all have for this franchise. And so, so that all I want to say is I don't ever see this discourse going away. I think it's healthy and I think we should keep having it and I'm going to keep engaging in it. But what's important is that we all stay respectful um, uh, around everybody else's choice. Now for myself, what I like as someone who has experienced world as my initiation, gone to rise and then gone back to the old games. So I've tasted a little bit of everything. There is something I like about all the games and there are things I don't like about all the games. I tend to align myself more as a world fan and I might be biased, which is why I want to go back to world to eventually properly replay that and compare it to the old world. But I can tell you that comparing world and rise, I've never hit it. I've always preferred world uh, because I've, oh, I did like the more intentional ecology, uh, the hunting aspect of world that as this um, YouTuber said is just not the priority for rise in rise it's a lot more around the gameplay mechanics. It's all about, you know, it gives you ton more skills. It gets you to the monster quicker. It's all about, you know, it's a whole different fighting mechanic, way more skills. It's just different gameplay. And I can also recognize that in the World and Rise releases, we lost a lot from the old world. We lost that, the preparation aspect, which is something I feel needs to, to make a comeback in some way. And it's it's hard to, to say, you know, what is the right amount? I do think seeing the, mon for example, one thing I dislike about Rise is seeing the monster on the map at all times, that I dislike. That just takes me away from the immersion of I'm hunting a monster. I want to be able to track it. Now, I think the old world, there are a lot of things that are painful there, but some people would say, no, just give it to me like that and, and don't change anything about it. You know, removal of the hot and cold drinks, do we really, really need that? Um, I think, like, I think that the fine tuning is give us a little bit more preparation. Uh, I, I do think going back to camp to restock on everything, now that I've played everything, is maybe a little bit too much. Like the fact that you do have infinite healing, but on the flip side, as a new player, when I entered World, if I remember right, you can have access to your whole inventory from base camp if I remember correctly, that didn't feel to me like it was easy to a veteran player who has experienced the limitation of their inventory. I totally understand how that mechanic is, feels like basically a cheat code, but I can say as a new player that was playing world, it didn't make those hunts any less challenging to me as a perception. I went into those hunts as prepared as I could. And when I was depleting, even if I had to go back to camp, if I was going through that much uh, equipment and potions that fast, you know, I was probably means I'm struggling a lot uh, against the monsters. So I can see an argument being made for both. Um, I do think that there is going too far. And again, I, that's why I tend to dislike Rise more because the pickaxe, for example, you know, do we really need to carry the pickaxe in, in our inventory to mine things? That's something they took out in World, which to me, that's like, that's a comfortable change of let me mine all the time. I don't want to necessarily have to think, am I bringing my pickaxe on this hunt or am I leaving it behind? But then in Rise, they change the whole like, you know, one, two, three to just point and then you get like all this thing, which to me, that was like too far on one side. Now, in an ideal world, little mechanics like that, I could see them easily implementable as a custom experience to some degree. For example, mining. There is nothing that I see very complicated in coding a slider that says, let me go bunk and get all of my materials. 
versus let me go bunk, bunk, bunk three times to get my materials. And then that way the player can either go optimal or they can go to that more immersive experience. And I would probably put that naming in the slider from immersive to like efficient or something so that uh, those who want to be efficient with their time, they can do that. Whereas those that want a more slower experience. Uh, now having like a slider that goes like, oh, you don't, if you, you know, making a pickaxe optional on your, I, that's probably harder to program. So anyways, I do think that as the franchise matures, there can be more sliders to give more customization. And we see that already. So if they keep doing that, I think that's probably the best solution. But that aside, I also think we're going to be seeing, um, you know, multiple Monster Hunter verticals continuing, just like in the past, how there was the main line and the portable, and we have World and Rise. Right now we have Wilds, that's going to be the next main line title that's probably gonna stick more to World as this uh, YouTuber was saying. But I think what's exciting is we could probably expect three, four years after Wilds, we're probably gonna get another arcade version in the Rise vein with maybe all sorts of new ideas, which to me, that's exciting to just see like, what else could they do? I'm very excited about Wilds because that's like right up aligned with what I want. But to think that there's a team that's gonna work on just some crazy ideas and new concepts, that's exciting too. And then you have like the weird spin-offs, like Monster Hunter stories, which I know some people that they just cannot get into Monster Hunter. Like they cannot play the game, but they are, they are drawn to the community. They are drawn to the world. And Monster Hunter Stories is the game that lets them engage with the world, understand what these monsters are, and understand just the lore of the world. Because they can do the RPG, they just can't do the action, or they just don't get derived joy. So at the end, you know, I think, I think the my key takeaway is it all comes down to respect and the fact that we are so lucky to have a franchise that is not a single plate offering; it's a buffet. And at the buffet, you can pick whatever you want. You got some different meats. You don't like meat? Okay, you got some vegetarian options. And that's the thing here. You like the old games? You can go play the old games. Online multiplayer? Getting a little harder for the old games, but there are ways around it. You like world? World is all there. You know, you look at the world return campaign right now. Nothing has been added to the game, and yet players are surging back to the game just because it holds up well. You want to play Rise Sunbreak? That's there too, and there's a good community. So I'm really excited to see all the new ideas, all the new concepts. And I look forward to continuously debating, discussing, and talking about the pros and cons. Because every time I talk about some, some mechanics or watch these videos, I oftentimes get an aha or a newfound appreciation of a mechanic or a newfound perspective. And that just lets us enjoy these games more because we can go back to them with that new perspective and be like, oh, I hadn't thought of that or I hadn't looked at it that way. Um, just like now that I played Monster Hunter 3 you, for you and a little bit of the first one, I want to go back to world and say like, what's it like experiencing this knowing the game was like this before? Uh, and I think that's what's really rewarding about this uh, franchise. You have a rich community and then you have a rich diversity of games that just try a lot of different things. And even when I like explore all this, for example, a lot of people are telling me, go back to Monster Hunter 2. A lot of new ideas and crazy stuff there. And I'm getting more and more intrigued. I'm like, I want to see what they're doing in there. Generations. I know that there's the Prowler in there. I don't know anything about like how to use it and all that. It's a new concept that we haven't seen anywhere else. And it's unique to that title. Cool. I want to go try it. And, you know, the fact that all these titles have unique elements like that, I think just makes it all that much better. Unlike another franchise, I'm going to toss Mario under the bus here. You know, if you've played Mario Wonder, maybe that's a bad example. If you played the new Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe, you'd be like, and if you liked it, you'd be like, oh, I wonder what the other games are like. And if you go back and you play new Super Mario Wii, you're like, oh, it's just the same thing. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, not that Mario is, is not diverse in other games, but I do find it, it's, it doesn't add that many mechanics or try that many things from its mainline 2D platform. Anyway, maybe Mario wasn't the best example, but I hope you get what, you, what I mean. So uh, if you like this, if you ever um, like these types of React videos, let me know. Uh, I'm happy to see any suggestions you have of other videos. Drop those links down in the comments so I can see what else you guys are watching or what you think would be good to watch together. And if you have thoughts, on you know the this divide of fans what do you think about it do you have a preference how do you approach these kind of divisions do you think it's healthy do you not think it's healthy let me know let's talk about it and uh, i'll see you on the next video so until next time keep it classy